A lot of this isn't going to make sense to you. And I'm sorry about that. I'm just going to start at the beginning with the house. I lived here until I was 11, but I wasn't allowed inside half the rooms. Inside the mailbox were bills from seven years ago, marked urgent, open immediately. I hadn't been back since my brother Lewis's funeral. In her will, my mother left me a key, but didn't tell me what it unlocked. Maybe she thought I'd know, or she thought that the mystery would be enough to bring me back. No one had driven this way in a long time, but I saw a few hoof prints. The truth is, even after I inherited the house, I never thought I'd come back to it. But now I had questions about my family that only the house knew the answers to. The house was exactly like I remembered it, the way I'd been dreaming about it. As a child, the house made me uncomfortable in a way I couldn't put into words. Now, as a 17-year-old, I knew exactly what those words were. I was afraid of the house. Crawling through the doggy door used to be a lot easier when I was 11. The power had been turned off the night we left. For the first time in years, I felt like I was home. But instead of a family, there were just memories of one. Like how after Lewis started working at the cannery, we all got sick of eating salmon. Except our cat, Molly. The table was still a wreck from the night we left. My mom was the only one of us who could It was like a bomb it. had gone off, killing everyone but sparing the furniture.
Nothing in the house looked abnormal. There was just too much of it, like a smile with too many teeth. Even the fireplace had a story. Edie told me the bricks came from the original house after it sank. Great Grandpa Sven built a music box for Barbara, along with the rest of the house. After Milton disappeared, Mom sealed up all the bedrooms. Then Edie retaliated and drilled peepholes. My Grandpa Sam spent seven years sharing a room with his dead brother, Calvin. As a kid, I just assumed every house had peepholes and sealed rooms you weren't allowed inside of. I spent a lot of time playing in Great Uncle Walter's room. I think my mom sometimes regretted not sealing it up. Lewis told me there were secret passages, but I never believed him. Turns out, my mom was really good at keeping secrets. Now it was time to find out what my mom had been afraid of. From the paintings on the wall, it was clear my brother Milton had been here before me. Reading this, maybe it sounds like I had a plan. But I had no idea what was behind that door. Just like I had no idea where all this was gonna lead. I grew up looking at Molly's room through the peephole. Being inside for the first time, I felt like I'd stepped behind a painting. I got the sense Edie had spent a lot of time here before my mom sealed the doors. Molly's gerbil had a tiny bedroom with its own even tinier gerbil cage. December 13th, 1947. Dear Diary, I'll be gone soon, but I wanted to tell somebody about what's gonna happen. 
It started when Mom sent me to bed without dinner. I woke up and I was starving, so I looked around for something to eat. My Halloween candy was all gone. I thought about eating Christopher, but I held back. I kept eating and eating. I ate a lot of things that night. Then I heard chirping outside my window. It was a barn swallow going back to her nest. I reached out for her. And suddenly, I was a cat. I tried to be quiet, but the bird was really scared. Mom and Dad didn't even look at me. I jumped and I almost got her. I could tell she was getting really tired. Now I was up in the big tree. I promised Dad I wouldn't climb it anymore. All I cared about was eating that mama bird. I gobbled her up. And suddenly, I was an owl. First, all I heard was the wind. Then I heard little teeth nibbling in the grass. his face looking up and seeing mine through my talons. I swallowed him up and I didn't chew one bit. <laughs> then I flew off to find something bigger. A mama rabbit! She was almost too big to carry. I started choking, but I couldn't stop eating. And suddenly, I was a shark.
I rolled off a cliff and into the ocean. Now, I was hungrier than ever. I wanted fat, juicy seals. I tore off her flipper and it tasted really good. In my eyes, everything had changed. Now I was a monster, and I smelled people everywhere. I was big, but I moved real quiet. to stop, but also, I didn't. onto the sand, and the good smell went into an old pipe. I got closer and closer. All my stomach started growling. And suddenly, I was me again. I held my breath for a long time, but I couldn't hear anything. I think it's waiting for me to fall asleep. But it's not going to wait much longer. It needs to be, and we both know I will be delicious. I'm not sure if I believed all of that, but I'm sure Edie would have. I can't describe it, but I felt like some part of Molly was still here. This will be obvious later, but my mom never told me any of these stories. 
Edie would have, but Mom didn't like bringing up the past. Though, when we adopted a stray kitten, she was the one who named it Molly. I spent a lot of time in Great Grandma Edie's room. Her room was like a museum. For 500 years, the Finches have been famous throughout Norway for their fortune and misfortune. Odin Finch buries the latest victims of the family curse, his wife Ingeborg and their newborn son, Johan. On January 7th, 1937, he set sail with his family and his house, hoping to leave the curse behind. But 40-foot waves off the coast of Washington send the house and Odin to the bottom of the sea. Odin's daughter Edie, with husband Sven and baby Molly, step ashore on their new home, Orcas Island. Odin Finch is the first to be buried in the new family cemetery. His daughter Edie is already dreaming of a new Finch house. Whatever's wrong with this family, it goes back a long ways. When Edie told people Sven was killed by a dragon, she could also have said he was building a dragon-shaped slide that collapsed. She could have, but she didn't. Even in her 90s, sometimes Edie seemed a lot younger than my mother. One summer, they evacuated the island, but Edie refused to go. For a few weeks, she was a celebrity. I hadn't thought of myself as Edith Jr. for a long, long time. Edie gave a big interview about a mole man living under the Finch house. My mom was furious. Edie knit me a new pair of gloves every year, just in time to replace the old ones. Louis died a week before we left, but Edie had already started to memorialize him. The only trace Grandpa Sam's first wife, Kay, left on the house was the pink bathroom. It was a pretty big trace. There's a secret in this bathroom. It's in the last place you would look. It isn't in the cupboard. It's hidden in this book. Ben gave Sam an old camera he'd refurbished. He never put it down. I knew Grandpa Sam had a twin. 
and that he never talked about him. I guess my grandpa didn't like history any more than my mom did. How I Want to Remember My Brother by Sam Finch. The thing I remember is that when he made up his mind, that was it. My brother said he'd die before he ate another mushroom, and he did. At Barbara's funeral, we swore we'd never be afraid again, and he wasn't. I think Calvin always wanted to fly. Calvin! Dinner's ready! Coming! But that day, he finally made up his mind to do it. I told him going around was impossible. Maybe if I hadn't said that. Alvin, I'm not gonna tell you again. Maybe if the wind hadn't picked up. Then maybe he'd still be here. But I doubt it. I think he'd already made up his mind. That's what I want to remember about my brother. <laughs> the day he made up his mind to fly, and he did. Calvin's story felt strangely familiar. When I was younger, I remember trying to do the exact same thing. After the funeral, Edie roped off Calvin's half of the room. Mom said Grandpa Sam enlisted at 18 and never set foot in the room again. Passages were a pretty tight fit. They'd obviously been built for smaller hands and bellies. Growing up, I always thought of Barbara as a child star. I never thought about how hard it must have been for her afterwards. A 
of all the stories people wrote about Barbara's death, I'm surprised Edie saved this one. Old Jack here with another ghastly tale inspired by America's most unfortunate family. I'm calling it The Surprise Ending of Barbara Finch. As a child star, Barbara was famous for her scream. Now at 16, she was all washed up has been. But in a lucky break, she'd been asked to perform her signature scream at a local convention for monster movie fans. It was just the boost her career needed. Unfortunately, her scream hadn't aged well. <coughs> mm, getting better. I think you just need the right motivation. Her biggest fan and current boyfriend, Rick, was about to demonstrate when... Now that was a great scream. It was Barbara's father, Sven. He'd slipped into a table saw and had to be rushed to the emergency room. So Barbara got stuck babysitting her youngest brother, Walter. Her convention comeback was canceled. Okay, I'm hearing frustration, but I'm not hearing terror. What if I tried... A gang of hoodlums and Halloween masks have been terrorizing Orca's Island tonight. Police are urging residents to... That came from the basement. You're right. Also, I loved your delivery on that. Why is your basement door locked? Because my dad likes making puzzles and secret passages. There's a key hidden in the music box. The secret is to keep winding and winding until finally the key pops out. Thanks, babe. I'll be back in a sec. 20 minutes later, Rick hadn't returned. So Barbara went to look for him right on cue. She reached for the music box. And as she wound the key, she listened for Rick, but the house was silent. She found Rick's crutch and imagined the worst. leader is the infamous Hookman killer, Dr. Carl Hamill, who impaled and then ate his family ten years ago tonight. The old fridge rattled and grew still. Relax. I was just trying to scare you to help you find your scream. Well, I'm not scared, Rick. I'm furious. Then act furious. All I'm getting from you now is that you're hurt and confused and you're... She threw him out, but she kept a little something to remember him by. Barb, have you seen my other crutch? And she was still holding it when she fell asleep watching the late, late picture show. Hours later... Barbara! Walter, what's going on up there? Ah! Okay, I'm coming up, but if this is a trick, you're dead, Walter. Still on. 
Orca's Island police describe the man as six feet tall with a steel hook for a hand. Residents are urged to lock all doors and windows and notify the police of any suspicious activity. I returned, saw the hook man, and was speechless. He was quite smashing. <laughs> Couldn't get enough of Barbara. Okay, Barbara. There's got to be another way out of here. That night, she played her part beautifully. She thought about abandoning Walter, but just couldn't do it. All she heard was... <gasps> At the door, she heard whispering. It was coming from inside the house! <gasps> oh dear. She saw what kind of monsters they were, and she realized what was about to happen. She was going to be famous. And with her final breath, Barbara Finch gave the performance of her life. I wasn't there myself, but I hear Barbara was magnificent. Poor girl. She had a taste for stardom. But unfortunately, so did her fans. Of course, the police blamed it all on poor Rick, who disappeared the same night. And little Walter? Hiding under his bed the whole time. He took it all pretty hard. But that's another story. As for Barbara, tucked inside the music box is all they ever found of her. Her ear. Now that's what I call a real eerie tale. Edie told me all Barbara wanted was to be remembered, as absurd as that comic was. Maybe what Edie saw was a happy ending. I guess now I know why Mom didn't like me playing with the music box. Whenever people ask me about my family, the first thing they always want to know about is Barbara. A 
lot of things got left behind in the whirlwind of that last night. My mom wasn't much of an optimist, but she never stopped believing that my brother Milton was alive. Mom said the basement was off limits, unless I wanted another tetanus shot. I saw Edie sneak down to the basement once, carrying packages. I thought maybe she was hiding presents. It turned out she was hiding a lot more than that. I remember asking mom once about where Walter had gone. She said after Barbara died, he got as far away as he could. If there's a pattern in all these stories, I think it's that none of us has gotten very far. Goodbye, everyone. I can't believe I've been down here for 30 years. On that first day, after the shaking started, I didn't think I'd survive a week. But after a few days, I settled into a routine. That's what kept me sane. Having a schedule, living for today, I always expected to be dead tomorrow. But if you wait long enough, you get used to anything. Even a monster on the other side of the door starts to feel normal, almost friendly. And then one day, everything just stopped. Whatever that thing was, it was gone. Maybe it got tired of waiting. Or maybe I just got tired of being afraid. It's been a week now, the longest in 30 years. I'm done waiting. I have to leave while I still can. I know it's out there, somewhere. Whatever killed Barbara. And Molly. And Calvin. Maybe this is all a mistake. 
But I need to stop living the same day. Even if it kills me. Whatever's out there, I want you to know I'm ready for it. I'm going to appreciate all of it, especially the food. I don't mind if I only have a year left. Or a month. Or a single week. I'd be happy with one new day. I can already imagine the sun on my face. Walter died when I was six. I can't believe my mom never told me he was down here. I'm sure my mom was trying to protect me. Maybe she was afraid I'd end up like Walter. But if she never told me about an uncle under the house, I can only imagine what else she was hiding. I don't want to make the same mistakes she made. Trying to bury something that's still alive. Now that there's only one of us left, or maybe two, I thought it was time I heard the stories for myself and found out what happened to everyone else. But now I'm worried the stories themselves might be the problem. Maybe we believed so much in a family curse, we made it real. I don't know if I should even be writing this. Maybe it'd be better if all this just died with me. But I thought you should know about your family. And the history you're a part of. Though, to be honest, I feel as lost as you probably do right now. I think the people in these stories believed them, for what that's worth. And when you look at the house, that history of imagination and stubbornness and madness, any of it seems possible. We've been surrounded by death for so long, we've just gotten used to it. What kind of family finishes building a cemetery before starting the house? It's embarrassing for me to admit this, but the pet cemetery may be more uncomfortable than the human one. Three of the gerbils are mine, and Two had been my fault. Sven built the house, but it was Edie who designed the cemetery.
I'm sure Odin's monument had been Edie's idea. My mom was always trying to move on, but for Edie, the past never went away. She could see it poking out of the water at low tide. Edie said she dreamed about the old house every night. Edie's side was always easier for me to understand. But the older I get, the more I can see where my mom was coming from. Her dad had been pretty strict, but it wasn't enough to save her brothers. She was just trying to do better. She lost two of her brothers, just like I did. I get why she tried so hard to protect us. We never found Milton's body, so my mom insisted we were putting up a monument, not a tombstone. There's so many things I wish I could ask my mom now. Part of me thinks this is what she wanted all along. For me to come back someday and find everything out for myself. But looking back on it now, If she told me there was going to be so much climbing, I never would have come when I was 22 weeks pregnant. I never met Grandpa Sam, but I think he and my mom had a lot in common. They were both pretty intense. Dawn, I promise, you'll never forget this weekend. Yes, sir. These memories are gonna last a lifetime. Mm hmm Am I gonna have to shoot anything? It's a hunting trip, Dawn. Shooting is strongly encouraged. What? Perfect. It's gonna rain the whole weekend, isn't it? Never forget this weekend, Dad. That's the spirit. Okay, got it. I'm gonna take some pictures, okay? Just be careful. The camera's older than you are. Aw. You're right, Dad. It's starting to clear up. Still freezing, though.
Definitely should not have drunk all that coffee. Nothing quite like being outside. Hmm. Hold still while I take a picture of you. Hey! <laughs> That's a keeper. I'm just saying, I'm not always gonna be here, Don. You'll need to remember this stuff, if you want to survive. I'll be fine, Dad. You know who else thought he was gonna be fine? Some guy who died. Don, I'm being serious. I know, Dad. You're always serious. Doesn't being out here make you want to chill out? Well, to tell you the truth, I haven't been out here in 20 years. Don, don't you think you could find something more interesting to photograph? Last time I was with my brother Calvin. Man, that was a great trip. Your grandpa Sven taught us how to fish. How to build a fire. Eyes, Don. Before you take the shot, let me get a picture of you. Dad, I, I... just breathe. Turn up. Let me get behind you. Do I have to do this? Don, you don't have to do anything. But if you want to survive, you'll need to be strong. Great shot, Don! Proud of you, Don. Always remember that, okay? <laughs> Sorry, Don, just gotta reset the timer. <laughs> Dad, it's twitching. I think That's it's totally so normal, Don. Just focus on the camera. Try not to think about- Dad! Oh! Of all these stories, that's the one I wish most that my mom had told me. Sam spent his life shooting photos, but Mom said he got nervous being in front of the camera. I guess we're all afraid of something. Instead of hiding from death, Sam seemed to go out of his way to meet it. After Sam died, my mom and Edie got really close. They'd both lost a lot.
Dear Kay, do you remember the way Gregory used to laugh when he thought he was alone? Like something funny was happening, but only he could see it. I think he saw things the rest of us don't. Hold on, sweetie. Hello? Sam, I told you I don't want to talk right now. I wonder what he saw. What his world was like. sounds. But I worried about a baby being too happy. But I could feel him slipping away. Sorry about that, Gregory. I know you did everything you could. Maybe if I hadn't called that night. Sam. My mom moved up to the loft after her brothers died. 
At the time, it was as far away as she could get. I can't imagine what it was like for her to lose two sons after she'd already lost two brothers. She spent a summer building houses in Calcutta, where she met my dad, Sanjay. My mom moved to India a week after graduation and got a job teaching English. Louis was born a year later. When my dad died, I don't think mom knew where else to go. I'm sure Edie was happy to have her back. And to see kids in the house again. The house had to get a little bigger, but Edie was used to that. And for a while, things were good, almost normal. But it didn't last. The beginning of the end was Milton's 10th birthday, when Edie gave him a castle. Milton Finch in The Magic Paintbrush. I was four when Milton disappeared. Mom spent months searching for my brother. Then she sealed the doors. Whatever Milton had found in the house, Mom didn't want it getting out. Mom definitely blamed Edie, but I think Lewis blamed himself. After he graduated, he just spent more and more time in his room until Mom got him a job at the cannery. Lewis's room smelled very, very familiar. That part of him lived on.
Dear Mrs. Finch, as Lewis's psychiatrist, I can understand your desire for an explanation. As I see it, the trouble began in January, shortly after we convinced your son to seek treatment for substance abuse. Newly sober, I believe Lewis first noticed the monotony of his daily life. He kept working at the cannery, but he withdrew part of himself. In our sessions, I saw the same behavior. His mind began to wander. I asked him to describe it. He said he started small, imagining a labyrinth. He'd feel his way about. Then something moved. Bats. And toads. and things that have not names. He knew it was all in his head. But he took it very seriously. I had hoped he'd find himself. But he found something more. I worried about him then, daydreaming at the cannery. I spoke with his boss, but he said Lewis had become a model employee, methodical, tireless, focused, like a whole new Lewis. So I let him go on. I even encouraged him. It seemed very promising at first. He told me he'd made a new friend. On the edge of a city he named Lewis Topia. He built the city up slowly, brick by brick. Then he made musicians. and songs for them to play. He talked about starting a band. And he was always humming something. Every day his imagination grew stronger. He no longer spoke at the cannery. But his chopping was as reliable as ever. Then one day it struck him that all the cheering crowds, even the stones under his feet, were all in his imagination. So he could do whatever he wished. He held an election for mayor. And he won. They begged him to stay, but his mind was already wandering. It became a game for him. He'd conquer a city, then immediately push on. New Louisville. St. Louis. 
he started drifting away from our reality. Minneapolis. Until one day he forgot to go home from the cannery. Even as his mother pleaded with him, part of Lewis kept sailing on. In Lewisburg, he heard rumors of a Beautiful prince. The prince was on his own quest for... Radiant rainbows. He followed the sound of his electric sitar. His chase led him to a golden palace east of the sun and west of the moon. Even then, his logic remained sound. He knew the world was all in his imagination. But he was so proud of having created it. In his own eyes, he'd become something greater than a king. For someone who'd never known success in the real world, I think it was overwhelming. And then it struck him that the real Lewis was not the one chopping salmon but the one climbing the steps of a golden palace. My imagination is as real as my body, he told me. It was hard to argue with him. began to forget the world we know. I think it pained him to remember Lewis, the cannery worker. began to despise the man with a royal contempt. I still thought I could save him. Even after he said he was being crowned king over all the lands of wonder, The palace would be packed with his companions. Including the wise Calico who'd insisted on advising him.
his prince waited, holding his crown. There was only one thing left to do. Bend down his head. rest I think you know. Mrs. Finch, your son, was a kind man who will be missed by all of us who knew him. My brother was really cool. I wish you could have met him. On the way back from Lewis's funeral, my mom told me to start packing. She waited until the day before we left to tell Edie. I'm not sure if she wanted to make it easier or harder. I wish we'd stayed. But I understand why we left. My mom ended up leaving everything behind. What happened that night had been coming for a long time. Maybe it should have come sooner. But it had to end one way or another. All that's left now is to tell you about that last night. Last day, Edie just watched us pack and didn't say a word. Until supper, when she raised her glass and said, To our final night together, and all our final nights apart. Grandma, you know what I said about alcohol. Some of your medications are very Eden, specific. I left a present for you in the hallway. Why don't you go open it? The grown-ups have to argue now. I'm sorry, you're right. We're all leaving tomorrow. Let's just enjoy our last- I'm not leaving. Edith, you're excused. The power had been shut off that morning, but Edie always had plenty of candles. When my mom sailed the library, I don't think she knew about the other entrance. Or that Edie had a key to it. you're afraid of isn't going to end when you leave the house. Edith has a right to know these stories. My children are dead because of your stories. I think it's best if Edith and I leave tonight. We'll have the nursing home send a van for you in the morning. Okay? Dear Edith, there's so many stories I wish I could tell you, but there's only time for one. This is about what happened on the night you were born. That night, the tide went way, way out. It was the first and last time I ever saw the old house aground. There'd been an earthquake out in the middle of the ocean. They called it the lowest tide in a thousand years. God, it smelled awful. You know, I've seen that house every day of my life. But 
I never thought I'd go back to it. When the fog rolled in, I lost my way. I got turned around. For a while, I wandered. Seeing things. Things I'd forgotten had ever existed. But when I saw them, they felt like old friends. That night, a lot of things came back to me. Or maybe I came back to them. Things I can't explain, but that I need you to try and... Edith, what are you doing in here? It's mine. Edith! Mom, you're gonna rip it! Let go! I kicked and screamed, but... Mom dragged me to the car. I never saw Great Grandma Edie again. The next morning, the band came to pick her up, but she was already gone. After that, we moved around a lot. We both tried to make the best of it. A few years went by. My mom didn't like to talk about it. But she started getting sick a lot. <coughs> the rest happened pretty quickly. She got better for a while. And then she didn't. And then I was alone. last finch left alive. Until I found out about you. I'm still not sure what to tell you about all this. If we lived forever, maybe we'd have time to understand things. But as it is, I think the best we can do is try to open our eyes appreciate how strange and brief all of this is. This journal was supposed to be for you. But now I hope you'll never see it. I just want to meet you. And tell you all these stories myself. But I guess if you're reading this now, things didn't work out that way. This is where your story begins. I'm sorry I won't be there to see it. It's a lot to ask, but I don't want you to be sad that I'm gone. I want you to be amazed that any of us ever had a chance to be here at all. Good luck.
I can't imagine my mom ever writing poetry, and yet... A poem for Gus, who always said the wedding was a bad idea. Our father never hit us kids, at least not very hard, before the day my brother said with teenage disregard that he'd be dead before he'd see a wedding in our yard. My father made him come, of course, but Gus stood far apart, just flew his kite and bottled up the storm inside his heart. I tried to talk him out of it, but though he'd never met her, we don't need a stepmom were the words that I now pronounce you husband and wife. You may kiss the bride. When the time for photos came, Dad ordered him to come, come here. here. But Gus declined, and as a sign, held up his middle finger. The wind picked up, and panicked geese appeared and quickly went. But all the humans did that day was go inside the tent. Rain came down in buckets then, but no one seemed afraid that nature might destroy the tent our dad had crudely made. Thunder sounded much too close and full of angry power, but all my father said to this was, Make the music louder! I wish that I could truly say I thought about you on that day. Out there on the beach alone, just you, the wind, the sea, and foam. But I didn't. Until we found you. She never talked about him, but Mom told me once if I was a boy, they were going to name me Gus. Thank you.